Very cool. So now we will move on to the ever popular case-based discussion. So I'll invite our moderators, Dr. Sky Mayo and Dr. Milton Javle. Um, Dr. Mayo is an associate professor of surgical oncology at Oregon Health Sciences University and the Knight Cancer Institute in Portland, Oregon. He's board certified in both complex general surgical oncology and in general surgery, having completed a surgical residency at Johns Hopkins and a fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. His clinical practice serves patients with cancers in the liver, bile ducts, gallbladder, and pancreas. And then Dr. Javle is a professor of GI medical oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, Houston, Texas. Oh, sorry, yes, let's, let's clap for Dr. Mayo. <laughs> And, and then Dr. Javale is at MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, where he leads the biliary cancer program. He graduated from Grant Mental College in India and did his residency at SUNY Buffalo, an oncology fellowship at Roswell Park, um, where he specialized in GI cancers. And he has been at MD Anderson since 2007 and one of our leaders. Thank you. very exciting uh, session this morning, hopefully to stimulate some discussion from the audience. I'd like to thank the Kalangia Carcinoma Foundation for putting this together and I think inviting speakers from around the world to showcase novel work that's being done in this space. Um, we first, uh, what we'll do is we'll go through several uh, presentations focusing on different treatment modalities and then we'll leave time for a panel discussion to take questions from the audience at the end. So, Yeah, just to echo what uh, Sky mentioned, we hope this is interactive. And we really want to engage the audience here, and um, uh, not just the clinicians, but patients, providers, caregivers, because a lot of the cases uh, really deal with um, situation, real-world scenarios where we could use your, your help in questioning these investigators. Uh, we'd like to first welcome, uh, I think the next slide if we could. is uh, uh, Dr. Bas Groot Korkamp um, from Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, uh, who is a surgical oncologist who I had the pleasure of training with uh, when I was at Memorial many years ago. Um, and uh, Bas has really done some novel work, both in biliary drainage and hepatic arterial infusion, and I think is a real thought leader in clinical trial design and pushing the boundaries for what's possible and what we should do be considering for patients uh, who have um, cholangia carcinoma. Bas? Uh, I'm very honored to stand here. Uh, it's the first time I'm at this meeting and uh, I'm very impressed uh, uh, and honored that I can contribute to this meeting. So um, we've heard uh, yesterday and today a lot of uh, uh, actual novel uh, interventions from the past two years. The, the, I will talk about uh, using a, a, a patient of mine about two interventions that are actually not novel. They're actually from the 90s. And, I'm going to argue that uh, we can improve patient outcomes a lot by doing things, uh, implementing interventions that we already know that are effective. So this is a patient of mine I met uh, three years ago in my clinic, a 70-year-old female who presented with painless jaundice. I'm only showing you one slide here, but uh, if you run through this scan, it's obviously intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. There are three large uh, liver lesions. There's no extrahepatic disease. And uh, what you can also perceive is that there are dilated uh, bile ducts. And so this is the first part of my uh, presentation. I want to focus on biliary drainage. I think it's a very important topic for uh, uh, cholangial carcinoma because most patients with perihylocholangial carcinoma and also many patients with intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma like this patient or gallbladder cancer actually pre present with painless jaundice. So that's the first concern for the patient and for the doctor to resolve, because if we don't resolve the biliary, uh, the biliary obstruction, the patient is uncomfortable and we cannot give any treatment. So uh, uh, a biliary obstruction is mostly at the distal end of the bile duct, uh, like in pancreatic cancer or distal cholangial carcinoma, and those obstructions are relatively easy to resolve. But a higher biliary obstruction is much more challenging to resolve, and consequently the outcomes are very poor, as I'll show you. Just to show you the Dutch data, so we have in the Netherlands, we have uh, uh, universal health coverage. And so everyone has access to, to all the treatments, but nevertheless, 
only about one in six patients with advanced periohylocholangiocarcinoma who are not eligible for resection or for transplant can receive, do actually receive systemic treatment. And of course, this includes a few octogenarians and patients with a poor performance status. But I think the main reason is that these patients do not get to treatment because they never get adequate biliary drainage. And so if we really want to offer all those new treatments that we've heard about to, and really have an impact, we should at least start with resolving biliary drainage so we can actually treat all those patients. So I'll just briefly go through the literature on outcomes of biliary drainage. And the first question is always, should we drain endoscopically or percutaneously? And there are actually only two trials, and both of them you'll notice are very small. The first trial was here in the US, and it had trouble accruing patients. So you know, if you have fewer patients than centers that were open, that's never a good sign. Uh, and this study included all patients with uh, malignant hyalobiliar obstruction, all stages. And just to show you one result that I think is very striking, eight out of 13 patients uh, passed away within three months. We did a, another study in the Netherlands in four uh, centers, uh, slightly bigger, 54 patients, and this was more uh, a specific subset of patients, only periohylocholangiocarcinoma, and they had to be eligible for resection. Um, what is quite striking, and you don't see many patients in any paper showing this, is that only about half of the patients actually ended up getting a resection. Most publications on periohylocholangiocarcinoma are about the ones that had a resection. And the median overall survival is really so poor, it looks like these patients uh, only received systemic treatment. And that's, many of them never had any treatment, so no surgery and no palliative uh, uh, chemotherapy or any systemic treatment. And the reason is because of the biliary drainage complications. So these were small series. Let's look at the really large series. This is a very nice paper I recently discovered from, uh, from England. 16,000 patients who presented with biliary obstruction in the palliative setting and who had percutaneous drainage. And about a third of them had biliary tract cancer and the median survival was when it's in, expressed in days, that's never a good sign. It was only three months. We did a similar study looking at ERCP in Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And those are the two major referral centers with I think best of, in the world uh, endoscopists. And we selected the subgroup of patients uh, with advanced periohylocholangiocarcinoma who had their first biliary drainage in the Netherlands, uh, in, in the tertiary center. And again, 90-day mortality was one in three. And the reviewers didn't believe their results because all the, the uh, gastroenterologists said, this cannot be true, our results are so much better. But there's no publication in literature with better results than this. So what is the solution to this? Because clearly we need a solution. And the solution is relatively straightforward because this biliary drainage is so complicated because patients get cholangitis. And cholangitis is horrible and, and life-threatening. And uh, because they get cholangitis, they need re-interventions. And uh, so in the cohort I just showed you, patients on average had five endoscopic biliary, endoscopic or percutaneous re-interventions. So this is what we do. Uh, uh, we place primary percutaneous metal stents. We don't cross the ampulla. We don't leave an external drain and we glue the puncture track. And the rationale is that if you need biliary drainage, you do not want infection. And where does the infection come from? Either from the bowel or from the skin. So if you use this approach, there's no infection or uh, at least less risk of infection. And this is not new. This also is not something I am doing. I'm a surgeon or interventional radiologist does it. This is something I picked up during my fellowship in Memorial. Uh, Dr. Karen Brown uh, was doing this. But the problem is that if you get painless jaundice, you go to a gastroenterologist. And if you go to a gastroenterologist, you're getting an endoscopic stent and not a percutaneous stent. So back to our patient. This is what we did in our patients with the large central liver mass. We placed, we meaning our interventional radiologist, placed two kissing metal stents. Uh, they're crossing the tumor. They don't cross the ampulla. You don't need to cross the ampulla. There's no tumor there. And we don't leave uh, an external drain. So uh, she recovered very rapidly uh, from the biliary obstruction. And she was actually one, uh, one of the patients in our uh, pilot. Somehow my uh, PhD student came up with the acronym TESLA. I, I still haven't figured out how uh, the, the study title ended up in TESLA. And this was also before uh, um, 
before uh, uh, Twitter got involved in the, in the Tesla name, so uh, apologies for that. But uh, so this is our pilot, malignant hyalobiliar obstruction patients, ineligible for resection or a transplant. Important to realize two-thirds of perihyalur, but it also includes about a third of the patients have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, gallbladder cancer, or even metastasis from colorectal liver meds, uh, from colorectal uh, cancer to the liver hilum. Uh, the patients were not allowed to have previous biliary drainage. And we placed one to three uncovered metal stents. And we started with a sample size of 10 patients, but we kept expanding. Uh, and this, the pilot is still running while we're waiting to open a, a randomized trial. So I'll show you some of the results. Uh, uh, please don't share this on Twitter because it hasn't been uh, published yet. Uh, so in our historical cohort, 75% of patients had cholangitis. And in this study, nobody had cholangitis. Uh, two patients had cholecystitis, and all the mortality was unrelated to uh, the biliary drainage. And this is just one table to show you the comparison with the historical cohort. And I think most striking is that we went from 20% receiving systemic uh, uh, treatment to 75%. And the reason it's not 100% because it included two patients on dialysis and one patient of 95-year-old and similar patients. So it's really an all-comer population. And it's, I think it's most amazing that something as simple as the approach of biliary drainage has a tremendous impact on uh, overall survival, as you can see here. So we are hoping to uh, soon open our, our randomized trial uh, to compare uh, this approach with uh, this uh, current standard of care. So back to our patient, uh, the, the bile ducts are drained. Uh, what are our treatment options? So this is kind of the flowchart I like. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there's a prominent place for intraarterial uh, chemotherapy. That's one of my other pet topics. Um, uh, because this patient has multifocal disease, uh, it's not, there's no extrapatic disease. Um, I mean, theoretically it is resectable, but that's at an exceedingly high risk, unacceptably high risk, and uh, probably not beneficial. So uh, we've heard a lot about all the systemic uh, treatments. I'm not sure this study has been shown. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, uh, systemic treatment studies from uh, Angela Lamarca again. I'm not sure whether she's still in the room. Um, and I like it because it sets the benchmark for uh, local regional treatment uh, of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So this is a subgroup analysis of the ABC trials, 32 patients. Uh, unresectable uh, liver only. One group is unresectable liver only. The other group, the other curve is metastatic disease. Interestingly, the curves are overlapping, really showing the importance of the liver disease. So basically what this, th these curves tell you is that it doesn't really matter whether you have extrahepatic disease if you have uh, advanced uh, biliary, uh, uh, advanced intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So the number you need to memorize from this slide is the three year overall survival. I used to say it is zero based on my appreciation of the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, but uh, Angela has a tremendous, uh, huge uh, supplemental file, which actually tells you it's exactly 2.8%. So what is the rational for intraarterial chemotherapy? Well, briefly, it, it's good to realize that uh, most patients have advanced disease, and uh, advanced disease in 50% of patients is confined to the liver. So there's liver-only disease. One of my favorite papers about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is from Andy Anderson, that's the, the Yamashita paper in cancer in 2017, which has an all-comer cohort, 500 patients, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and it looks at cause of death. And 70% uh, dies from biliary obstruction or liver failure. Then there's a nice systematic review showing that embolic treatments don't do very much. And so, to me, the only effective local regional treatment is in hepatic arterial uh, infusion chemotherapy. So why does that work? Liver tumors are predominantly perfused by the hepatic artery, and uh, there's this amazing drug, floxuridin. It, it's like 5-FU, but it, it's also a, a very old drug. But what is special about it is that it's extracted by the liver during the first pass effect. So you can give a, a very high dose. They even say a 400-fold higher dose at the tumor cell uh, level. So this is what it looks like, uh, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. We surgically place a catheter in the side branch of the hepatic artery. This is the pump subcutaneously placed. It's a very stupid pump. It's non-programmable, constant flow rate. It's nothing fancy. 
So very often people say, well, there's no evidence. Well, it's true there's no RCT, but uh, uh, I think there are uh, a lot of uh, targeted treatments we heard about the past few uh, uh, days that we're all convinced work, uh, who ha which have not been investigated in a randomized controlled trial. So these are uh, four phase two trials that investigated uh, hype for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, three of them are from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the first three, and they all have very consistent response rate, median overall survival, and look at the three-year survival. That's not 3%, this is between 30 and 40%. And we have replicated this trial, and the reason I replicated it in the Netherlands was not for scientific purposes, but uh, the drug is not registered in the, e in the EU. So my, the only way to get this treatment available to my patients was to do a phase two trial. And so in two years, we included 50 patients. And uh, I can't tell you the exact results yet, but I can tell you that they are exactly the same as the results from Memorial. <laughs> so back to our patient. Our patient underwent uh, pump chemotherapy, uh, uh, always combined with systemic treatment unless they already had systemic treatment. So some patients get systemic treatment and then when they progress, they get a pump. Uh, at a CAT scan at three months, you had stable disease. At six months, uh, partial response. And uh, unfortunately, uh, after 15 months, she developed ascites with peritoneal disease. Uh, she had no targetable uh, genomic alterations uh, and, uh, and a poor performance status by that time and, uh, and passed away after 18 months, which, uh, uh, is not very long, of course, it's way too short, but I think starting out with such a large central liver mass, uh, I think uh, usually the outcomes are way worse. I just added one slide uh, last night, just to be a little bit provocative. Uh, so uh, we've heard a lot about second and third line uh, treatments for advanced uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And first, of course, there's the uh, Angela Lamarca's uh, uh, Volvox uh, trial. Uh, uh, the, the advantage of it is that it applies to all patients, so you don't need to have a specific mutation. Median overall survival, six months, three year overall survival, zero percent. Um, then we have the two targeted treatments, and you'll notice that uh, 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 the results still aren't that good, but the patients with FUFR rearrangements do better regardless of treatment. And so uh, there's a promising 20 months overall survival, but again, only for the selected patient group. And then this is unpublished data that uh, Bill Jarnigan from Memorial kindly shared with me. And we're gonna add data from a few more centers, including our own trial. We looked at second line pump chemotherapy. So these are patients just like in the other trials who progressed on systemic treatment and they had uh, pump chemotherapy. Uh, the, the beautiful thing of this is that it, all patients are eligible, regardless of your mutational uh, profile. Um, and uh, the median overall survival was 30 months and the three-year survival 38%. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, two conclusion slides. Uh, one about biliary drainage. I think it's really an under, uh, 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 under-resourced uh, research topic. Uh, I think it's the number one challenge in probably about half of the patients who present with cholangiocarcinoma. And uh, both endoscopic and percutaneous drainage have very poor outcomes with lots of reinterventions uh, for cholangitis. And many of these patients spent the last few months of their life in the hospital. Uh, primary percutaneous stenting, I think, is very promising, as I've shown you, and we'll do a randomized controlled trial. And regarding the pump, I think it's, uh, th this disease is really perfect for intraarterial chemotherapy. It's mostly confined to the liver. Most patients will die from disease in the liver. And uh, if you compare this with systemic treatment, 3% versus 40% three-year survival, uh, I think it's really beyond reasonable doubt, or I think medical oncologists would call this a signal. Uh, I think it's at least promising. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to present our trial and uh, the memorial team uh, and we're participating in that uh, is uh, going to do a, a randomized control trial. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent boss, uh, like very uh, thought provoking and I think hopefully will stimulate some more discussion. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Sarah White um, up to the podium. We have uh, Dr. White's slides up, please. 
Uh, Dr. White is a professor of radiology and surgical oncology, and uh, she uh, is coming to us from uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin. I think arrived late last night. I did. Thank so I um, had a busy day in clinic and is going to share some cases that are going to be illustrative of the role of interventional radiology in helping manage patients with the spectrum of disease. Dr. White. I'm getting old. I had to bring my glasses up here. I thought maybe I could see, but no, not, not, not really. So interventional radiology, they often think of us as the plumbers, right? You heard about, can you put a stent in? Yeah, then pull out, okay, we're the plumbers. But we actually do other things. Um, but typically when we see patients, we see them in the end. When, patient, when nobody else has a, has a solution, they say, oh, can I ever try something? So I always think of interventional radiology as the people that come up with creative solutions to difficult problems. So here are a couple of very difficult problems. This is a 63-year-old female who initially presented with abdominal pain and distension, which is how many patients with cholangio show up. They don't show up with, when you have intrahepatic cholangio, with painless jaundice, they just have a bellyache. Many of my patients, my very first patient I ever treated um, as an attending, ate an egg sandwich, and she thought she had food poisoning. So she went to the ER, vomiting profusely, and she was found to have a central cholangio. So this woman, her CA-125 was um, 1,000, her CA-199 was 138, her LFTs were within normal limits, and she had this 18-centimeter really central mass with peritoneal carcinomatosis at the time of the diagnosis with most likely nodal um, metastasis. She got a biopsy just because her, her tumor markers were a bit odd, and it revealed that she had cholangiocarcinoma. So this is a very typical scan that we will see in IR. Um, the central mass, it's, it's clearly not resectable. There's no re residual liver or segment, two segments together of liver that could be resected. So just to set the stage, we've, we've seen these slides before, but just to sort of think about these numbers, you know, the ABCO2 trial, you're looking at overall survivals of 12 months. If we add in a Braxane, we're talking about 19 months. The new Topaz-1 trial, 12.8 um, months. So think about that in that setting. And then once we get to second line, we heard a lot about second line just a second ago. Think, think in that six-month range is what we're talking about. So now we have this patient. What are we going to do with her? We go on to first-line chemotherapy. She gets gemsis. And she has a really good response. But at about seven months into her treatment, she starts to develop pancytopenia. Her, she gets thrombocytopenic. Her platelets are just on the floor, she's having episodes of bleeding, having to come in for constant platelet transfusions. Her job, she actually, I've never heard of this, she's the only patient I've ever had that does this, she actually um, makes um, vitamins and they scrape the velvet off of antlers and this is some vitamin that she, she makes. So she's doing this and she wants to have a life, she doesn't want to be sitting in the hospital getting platelet transfusions and so she was referred to IR you know, is there something that you can do to help us? And so this is what her scan, um, oh, we'll, we'll talk about radioembolization. So we, we talked about whether or not radioembolization would be an option for her. So radioembolization is where we put a small catheter into the blood vessel that supplies the, the tumor, theoretically the tumor only, and we inject teeny tiny little beads. Those beads carry a radioisotope Y90, um, which will kill things via, it's a beta emission. And so, but it only will travel about a centimeter, so it can't go very far. So you're not going to get the toxicity of the surrounding organs like you would from external beam radiation. But we want to put this in the context. What is her overall survival going to be? Is she second line? Is she still first line? Where is she in this? So when we look at our overall survival from diagnosis when we fold Y90 into the mix, we have a median overall survival of about 20 months, which is not bad. That's pretty good. And from the time of Y90, we have 11 months. So think what I told you to begin with. We have these patients that nobody else really, we're done, we've tried first line, second line, third line, or they can't tolerate therapy. Now what do we do? Again, ABCO6, you're, we're talking about a six month overall survival. Um, so 11 months, this is what I quoted her. I said, you know, we can do Y90, um, and this is what we anticipate your overall survival is gonna be. This is what her tumor looks like. So you can see she's got hyper enhancement around the rim, but she's got some necrosis in the center. So she was having some sort of response um, but again, we talked about doing Y90. This is just what an angiogram looks like. Um, we get in there on the screen right, you can see the spleen, and then on screen left, that is what a hypervascular tumor looks like. And so that's that area, those beads are gonna go to whatever looks dark on the screen. We got out into the right hepatic artery because the majority of her tumor was gonna be 
um, on the right, it was right dominant. But you can see the majority of her liver is really supplied by that right hepatic artery. And what we try to do is we try to dose half of the liver at a time, but because of her anatomy, she had most of her blood supply coming from the right. So the way we dose this is we look at the tumor, we look at the volume of liver we're treating, and what you can see here is that her total liver volume is you know, 24, um, but what I'm treating is you know, 2,000. So I was treating a majority of her liver. Understanding you know, the toxicity with, with this is pretty good. Um, the, the main toxicity or the main side effect of this is fatigue, so patients will feel very tired for about two weeks. But really, other than that, patients tend to tolerate the therapy pretty well. So I treated her right lobe. Her platelet count at the time of treatment was 102. Her hemoglobin had come back up, so she was no longer anemic, and she was no longer neutropenic. So she was in a pretty good place when I treated her. Um, and this is what she looked like two months post Y90. So we really patted ourselves on the back. But what I didn't tell you is that there was this crazy, bizarre thing that happened to her. So she had, um, she developed, again, not pancytopenia, but she developed thrombocytopenia, probably related to the Y90. She wasn't thrombocytopenic, then she had Y90 and was, we don't understand why. Um, but she had a beautiful result. She actually ended up in the ICU with zero platelets. We sat with her and held her hand for an entire weekend while she had a GI bleed and transfused her. She got through that about three weeks later, um, was back out and scraping antler velvet. So this is what she looked like. She would, she would winter in Wisconsin and she'd, um, or I'd, she'd winter in Arizona and summer um, in Wisconsin, obviously. Nobody wants to winter in Wisconsin, including me, but okay. Um, and she was pretty horrified by this whole experience, so she decided that she did not want to um, undergo um, radioembolization of the left hepatic lobe. So she was maintained on capecitabine, um, and then she developed uh, disease progression, and she had worsening progression. This is one year uh, post Y90. You can see over time that right hepatic lobe lesion just has shriveled up, and that's what often we see with, with Y90. And you can see that left lobe disease um, has progressed. And she succumbed to her um, cancer two and a half years. As we talked about in the last lecture, 70% of patients die from liver failure, and she succumbed um, 19 months after Y90, two and a half years after the initial presentation. So this just says, you know, if you can't tolerate systemic therapy, is there another option? There certainly is if we can get there. Um, I show this case because this is a case of a more diffuse and broad um, uh, tumor. There, here's another patient. This is a 76-year-old male. Again, initially presented with abdominal pain, and he was, di he was diagnosed with diverticulitis. Okay, again, not presenting with what we would think to be a cancer. Um, and again, oops, there's something in your liver. His CA-199 was 25.5 at uh, diagnosis. His liver function was totally normal. He was an ECOG of one, so his performance status was good. He had 12 centimeter mass, which, which is really centered in the posterior aspect of the liver, which is good for me, not for him, but for me. And again, had a biopsy um, that showed cholangiocarcinoma. So this is what we're talking about. It's, it's sitting, that, that cancer is sitting way in the back part of the liver. And so the question is, when do we fold in Y90? So this is a guy that has new onset. He's got disease posterior lobe. Should we go on to resection? Shouldn't we go on to resection? It's a pretty big tumor. And so this is just some data from the MISPEC trial. This was a phase two prospective open label trial, multi-center, one out of France that looked looked at combining Y90 with systemic therapy. Should we be doing this earlier? Should we not give me patients in the salvage setting? And what does that look like? So the primary objective of this study was response rate. The secondary objectives were looking at the overall survival, what was the toxicity, and what was the disease control rate. The inclusion criteria are what you can imagine. We wanted patients that were older than 18 that had a reasonable performance status at baseline, that didn't have terrible liver function to start with, um, and then they, we didn't want them to have uh, extra hepatic disease. We, see we wanted, really wanted it confined to the liver just to see if this really would help. Um, exclusion criteria are things that you would imagine if they, they couldn't get the Y90 because of you know, technical problems when we, when we deliver the, the drug. This is sort of the schema of how many patients were, were screened versus how many patients actually were able to get it. Many patients were um, excluded because of extra hepatic metastasis or their ECOG performance status wasn't very good. And then when we go on to angiogram, not everybody is a candidate just based on your hepatic arterial anatomy. If I can't get a, a catheter in there to deliver the Y90 safely, you're not a candidate. And so they excluded four patients. So 41 patients went on to get therapy. Um, and this is just the schema of what 
when you would get it. So you would get systemic therapy. In the middle of the systemic therapy, you'd get a Y90. You'd go back on systemic therapy, and, we, and if we had to do both lobes of the liver, you would get that at a later time after your, um, your cycle of uh, gemsis. So what I'll highlight here is, before I tell you the responses, what's really important to me is that when I do a therapy, I don't increase your toxicity. So if I'm gonna give you systemic and Y90, I just wanna make sure that I'm not making you sicker in the process. And what you can see is the ABCO2 trial, the toxicity rate or the adverse event rate was about 70.7%. .7%. Um, and in the MISPEC trial, the toxicity was 71%. So 70.7 .7 and 71 to me, that's the same. So not any in additional toxicity when you fold it in Y90 in the first line. And here you can see beautiful, beautiful response rates with best response rate of 98%. When we look at secondary endpoints of overall survival and progression-free survival, we have 22-month overall survival. So if we think back to that ABCO2 with 11-month overall survival, we've doubled survival by folding in Y90 with GEMSYS. So this, to me, really is provocative data. So in this patient, is that what we really should be thinking about? The other thing to note about this trial is 22 patients, 22% 22 of patients went on to get surgical resection, and we know if we can get that tumor out of your body, you will live longer. It just makes sense, right? So 22% of patients in this trial went on to have surgical resection. So this is the patient um, eight months post Y90. You can see what happens. So no longer did I have to park my catheter in the right hepatic lobe and just let it go because it was a big tumor. It was confined to the back, and so I was able to give a very high dose, even a higher dose, um, you know, 100 times more than they could give external beam. And you can see total, it looks like I almost totally killed that area of the liver, and I did. This is called a radiation segmentectomy, and I did two segments. But the unfortunate thing that you can see is that he also has disease on the left. So would he be a surgical candidate? Theoretically, he would. But because he's got disease on the left hepatic lobe, he is not a surgical candidate and is going on to get systemic therapy, continuing on systemic therapy. But this, to me, is a, a, a very nice result in that patient. Here's another case. This is a 66-year-old male. Now we're gonna talk about patients that have underlying liver disease, and what do we do with these folks? Okay, he's got hepatitis C cirrhosis. He was found to have a mass again. He was living his life and found to have this mass on screening. His AFP was normal. He's not a CA199 producer. His LFTs, though he's cirrhotic, uh, were within normal limits. He had a five centimeter diffusely infiltrative mass. I'm gonna show you the mass. It was really sort of a quandary when we saw it. We didn't know what it was, um, and we biopsied it. He's a veteran. Um, which was where I was yesterday, the Veterans Hospital. And you can see, it doesn't look like a cholangiocarcinoma typically. It's just sitting in this segment five and really sort of scooching over to 4B. And that's where I talked about where the tumor is and can I get my catheter in there. And so sometimes we have to be a little bit tricky about how we, how we deliver our beads because this is not confined to one segment. So radiation segmentectomy, like I did to the last patient, it was confined to 6-7, which means that, that one artery went to both of those areas. This is gonna be a 5 and 4B, and those arteries are typically not in the same distribution. And so what happens if we start with, with Y90? What do patients do if, if that's our first-line therapy? We just say, we're not even gonna do systemic combined. This guy has single side of disease. He has no extrapatic disease. What if I just do a Y90? What is my efficacy on this? And this study looked at that. And so um, in this study, 52% of patients went on to surgical resection. When we were able to do what I'm anticipating or hoping to do to a patient like this, 52% of those patients are able to go on to have surgical resection. This is what he looks like now, okay, nine months after. So I just told you, I put my catheter and I can really get a really nice, nice treatment area in that segment. But what about that other thing in 4B? So what I did is I did a radiation segmentectomy, so radiation to one, and I went to that other area that just had that sliver, and I did a chemoembolization, and we'll talk about the data for that. The other thing to think about here is just another pa patient example, a really big hypervascular lesion and we did a rad seg on him. But we have to think about, can, is there something I can do to get you ready for surgery? So oftentimes, we're, we're left with patients that could be a surgical candidate, but the residual liver isn't big enough, and so is there a way for us to make that liver bigger? So if we do radiation to one, one part of the liver over time, and sometimes it can take up to you know, nine months, the residual remaining liver will grow if I do radiation to one part of the liver. So we have to think about that. Is there a way that I can grow the residual liver piece that's gonna be left behind by the surgeon while also treating the tumor? And yes, we can do that, and that was a case I showed you. Um, and that's, here's an example of that radiation segmentectomy I did, and this patient can go on to have a surgical resection. Um, 
here's my, I think, last case. Now we're even talking about a worse patient scenario, right? This guy um, has a tumor. You can see he's got ascites. He clearly has cirrhosis. Um, so what do we do with somebody like this? Um, again, systemic therapy is not a great option for these patients. He was a B8 uh, ECOG-1. But again, if we do radio radioembolization out of the gate, his overall, overall survival in this published uh, subset of patients was 22 months. That's pretty good. 22 months for patients that have really poor liver function and can't go on to get systemic therapy. Um, again, just showing the, 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 perf uh, the PFS um, of 7.4 months if you get radioembolization. The toxicities, again, adverse events are not anything outside of what you would get with systemic therapy. Um, and this is really his story. So he's a 70-year-old man. He's got, um, he's NASH. He's a B8, like I said before. He was requiring um, weekly paracentesis, and he had a mass that was found seven months earlier. He was lost to follow-up. He had uh, some issues. His creatinine was elevated. Um, his LFTs were within normal limits. And so really, they just didn't feel like he was a good candidate. This was a mixed HCC clangia when they did the biopsy. Um, and again, this is what he looks like after we do that radioembolization. So he had a really nice result. Um, he continued to need weekly paracentesis, um, and he eventually succumbed to his illness. I talked briefly about, is there something else we can do? This is just a patient that has a central lesion. Doing a Y90 in this area would be very difficult just because there's no real one blood supply. It's just sitting right in the middle. And so in the, these instances, you can do um, any of any number of liver directed therapies. I talked about Y90, but there's also chemobilization where you can infuse chemotherapy directly in. You can do bland embolization like they do at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, or you can do drug loading beads with these little teeny tiny beads that carry drug. And you can see the overall survival in all of those co cohorts um, is about 13.2 months. So when these patients come to us, we can get about a year, depending on um, which modality we use, it, it probably doesn't matter. When, we, when they come to us, what, what do we say portends a worse prognosis if they have a higher ECOG, so if their performance status isn't great? If they have a major complications like my patient had, um, that portends a worse prognosis. And if they have progressive disease or they're not responding to my therapy, that all makes sense. So those are just the things we think about. Chemoembolization, there was a big meta-analysis, and what it showed was that, that chemoembolization, um, the median overall survival, as you can see, there was 15.5 months good median overall survival. These are just all of the different papers showing um, what the response rates and survival at one year was 58% when you're doing chemobilization in this cohort. Um, complications in grade three toxicities, again, a 20% rate. So this is you know, very well tolerated, irrespective of what kind of chemo you're getting. You have a less than 1% mortality rate if you go on to get this therapy. And again, overall survival at one year, we're looking at you know, 60 to 70% in these patients. It's pretty good when you're coming in, and, and mainly we're seeing those patients in the salvage setting. So again, just as this is just what a clangiogram or a angiogram looks like. You can see that the hypervascular tumor, and that's how we're getting at chemotherapy. So that bright white stuff on the image left, that's the chemo. We mix it with oil, and it gets taken up into the tumor, and then we know we have a really nice response. This patient at six months, you can see the tumor has shrunk. And we can do this again and again and again, unlike Y90. This patient had four chemobilization treatments, and you can see over time we slowly chipped away at this tumor. And um, at eight, 18 months, the tumor is you know, barely visible on that screen. So in conclusion, combination therapy is safe and effective based on the phase two MISPEC trial. Um, the addition of local regional therapy prolongs overall survival and PFS. But clearly, we need to understand where we fit in um, and optimal timing of combination therapy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. White, for reminding us of two things. One, consider all options, including everything amazingly you guys can do in interventional radiology. And also that antlers are amazing and are the fastest growing tissue in the mammal, amongst mammals. So thanks for that. Um, I'd like to uh, now invite, um, uh, hold on, I missed the thing, I apologize, where we are. If we get to the next slide, please. Rachel. Rachel. Uh, Dr. Rachel Guest, who will be uh, joining us. Rachel, please come up. Another slide. Be in the right slide. Good morning. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here all the way from the UK. 
and also really wonderful to be able to share a case study of a patient who is currently under my care and uh, to share her journey with you. Dr. Uh, Guest slides up, please. Okay, so, uh, thanks. Uh, please, yeah. Dr. Guest. That's great. Um, okay, so my disclosure is that I am not a liver transplant surgeon. I'm a hepatobiliary resectional cancer surgeon, but I have trained and work. I trained and work in a liver transplant center, and I've developed a deep interest in the role of transplant in uh, perihyla cholangio because I've sort of seen firsthand the morbidity and sadly mortality that comes along with resectional surgery for these patients. So my case is of a 33-year-old fit and well healthy lady. Um, she uh, has uh, a known history of ulcerative colitis. This is quiescent disease diagnosed in 2014 when she presented with some mild rectal bleeding. It's been pretty asymptomatic on Pentasa since that time. In 2017, she was diagnosed with PSC when her uh, general practitioner, family doctor, found some cholestatic liver function tests uh, on some routine blood tests. This is her MRCP from uh, that time, and you can see that radiologically she had pretty severe stricturing disease at the time of diagnosis. So she has a dominant stricture in the left hepatic, oh, in the left hepatic ducts, but she also already at the time of diagnosis had a higher stricture and uh, at least two uh, strictures of the extra hepatic biliary tree. So this is a qu uh, quite classical uh, radiological pr uh, picture and uh, that was the basis of her original diagnosis. So she saw a specialist hepatologist at that time and was entered onto a surveillance program with annual uh, ultrasound um, bloods and colonoscopy. Uh, as I said, she's a fit and well lady. She works in, as an administrator. She doesn't smoke, she doesn't drink. She's got an excellent performance status. And she went away and lived her life up until January this year. At this point, she presented uh, to my gastroenterology colleagues at a district general peripheral hospital with a two-week history of pruritus and itch and jaundice. This was painless. She described pale stools and dark urine and denied any longer uh, history of weight loss, anorexia, or abdominal pain. These were her bloods at the time of her admission. So her bilirubin in uh, UK money is uh, 86, uh, but there was no uh, biochemical signs of infection. And her ultrasound at the time of diagnosis showed severe intrahepatic biliary dilatation um, especially in the left side of the liver. And this uh, comment from the radiologist at the uh, bottom of the scan saying there was a focal area of cholangitis um, led to her being admitted for uh, treatment with IV antibiotics under their care. So the MRCP was repeated, and uh, this showed some progression of her, uh, her known intra and extra hepatic stricturing uh, disease. So uh, particularly in the left liver, the uh, uh, dominant stricture had progressed, but more concerningly, there was now a severe hyla stricture um, of bismuth 1 type. So this is a pretty poor MRCP, but you can just about here uh, see the proximal common hepatic duct filling with bile there, and then the whole of the extra hepatic bile tree is pretty much uh, missing from uh, this scan. Uh, this is a CT scan, which didn't add a lot, but just to say that the left and right hepatic ducts uh, were remaining in continuity, um, and there was no uh, evidence of any uh, extra hepatic disease at that time. So she was treated for two weeks under the gastroenterology team with IV antibiotics in the hope that this uh, might improve her jaundice. Uh, however, it didn't. The bilirubin rose to 132 and she developed vomiting and eventually they arranged uh, a transfer to my center for uh, ERCP and drainage. And I was contacted on my on-call duty week uh, from the ERCPist, uh, who was about to put the scope down uh, for further discussion and a referral to our multidisciplinary tumor board. 
So we um, had uh, various discussions about the best way to uh, drain these patients. We've already heard that at the time of diagnosis, you're, you're really setting uh, the clock to time zero, and leaving these patients with external drains can really uh, lead to deterioration from a nutritional point of view. And so we uh, went on to do everything we could to drain her endoscopically with an internal drain. So we set up uh, a procedure uh, with, combined with our EUS and ERCP doctors with interventional radiology on, uh, on standby under general anesthetic to further assess the tumor. And her EUS was quite uh, useful, really, because this demonstrated quite a uh, well-circumscribed mass, which measured uh, uh, less than two centimeters in maximal diameter, uh, sitting at the top of the common hepatic duct, going up uh, the left side uh, into the liver, uh, which was in close proximity, although not invading the uh, proper hepatic artery in the portal vein. Uh, so she went on to um, ERCP, which was given the number of extrahepatic biliary strictures, a reasonably prolonged uh, and challenging procedure. But after many cannulations of the cystic duct, as you can see in the video, uh, they did manage to get a proper clangiogram and a 12 centimeter, uh, 10 French plastic stent was uh, 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 placed. So what's uh, this patient's uh, uh, options for management in the UK? Well, her, luckily her bilirubin has fallen, her LFTs have normalized. Um, she has seen uh, the dietetic service and uh, started on nutritional supplements. But um, as uh, you may well know, um, uh, transplantation for her is not currently an option in the UK and she started chemotherapy with uh, Gemsys. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a long time uh, summarizing the evidence for uh, transplantation in the setting of PSC um, and hyalurcalangina carcinoma, but our group in er Edinburgh as a center who is uh, obviously not transplanting for Calangio, hopefully did an objective, uh, relatively unbiased meta-analysis of, of the data in 2021. So we uh, analyzed studies, uh, 20 studies, encompassing 428 patients and demonstrated uh, good five-year survival uh, in patients who underwent neoadjuvant therapy with uh, a Mayo or Mayo-like uh, neoadjuvant protocol. Uh, so five-year survival of the order of uh, 65%. And that's significantly reduced if you don't undergo neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, but importantly, uh, the rate of recurrence, your risk of recurrence is halved if uh, you undergo neoadjuvant therapy. These data were similarly mirrored in a benchmarking study done, done by pierre Alain Clavion and Julie Heimbeck, uh, published last year in Annals of Surgery, um, where they uh, took a benchmark cohort, so uh, the, most, uh, the best patients treated by the best surgeons in the most high-volume centers, so 17 centers in the US and Europe, uh, 134 patients were analyzed, and they showed five-year survival of the order of 60%, and compared this to a match cohort of resectional patients um, who had a five-year survival of just 40%. So um, I presented this case as an example of uh, the differences in treatment that uh, are occurring uh, around the world. Um, because uh, we don't offer this treatment for her, she's being very kindly uh, assessed by our colleagues in St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. And I very much hope she might be considered and assessed for transplant. And uh, if anyone is in interested, I will try and update you as to her future progress and how she does. Thank you very much. Wonderful, and I think, uh, you know, this has really highlighted, I think, what is the importance of a multidisciplinary team evaluation at the outset for these patients. And you're seeing just some of the representatives of the team on this panel up here. Um, and at this time, I would like to uh, open up the, um, the floor to the audience. I, I think I see Dr. Roca, possibly. Yep, there he is. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. This was just an outstanding session. It just kind of contributes to how multidisciplinary, you know, the treatment of cholangiocarcinoma is. So, again, I, I applaud the, uh, the moderators, the panelists, and the program committee for putting this together. Um, I have a question and a comment. And so, um, 
and I'm just curious to hear the perspective, especially from this you know, very distinguished international group. Um, HAI therapy for cholangiocarcinoma. My disclosure is I'm a, you know, a surgeon, I do put these pumps in. But I think we've had some discussions at this meeting and others about the timing and the sequencing. And so, you know, should there be a period of induction chemotherapy prior to placement of pump a priori? Should we standardize that systemic treatment? I mean, you mentioned, you know, the ongoing international trial is using systemic GEMOX. In the Netherlands, uh, boss, you're using GEMSYS. You know, in the advanced setting, we have a new standard with GEM uh, CISDERVA. So how do we, you know, come together as a field and try to standardize that process? And then the second comment to Dr. Guest, again, a f fantastic presentation. I just want to be uh, disclosed, and I don't know if Dr. Elias may be behind me saying the same thing, is that, you know, EUS biopsy um, is going to negate transplant candidacy in the U.S. So um, okay. she'll comment on that. Okay, right. So maybe just boss then, <laughs> or the panel as well. Okay. All right. Boss. Yes, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Flavio, and uh, it's, it's a good point, and we don't really know what is best to start with systemic first, uh, uh, and, uh, and actually uh, I analyzed the memorial data, I don't think we published this, but we looked at the, all the patients who had pump for intrapatic cholangio, and we made two groups, the ones who had it as first line combined with systemic, and the ones who had it after systemic, and the survival curves were exactly overlapping. And the rationale, yeah, I think, is that if you get it as second line, you select the better patients, right? So you have a better outcome. But if you do that first line, you may salvage a few patients. Uh, I think if you really would do it case by case, what my philosophy is that I would start with pump if you're concerned for imminent uh, biliary obstruction. So if you have a large mass that is getting close to the liver hilum and you really want to avoid biliary obstruction, I would definitely go for liver-directed treatment, uh, pump, or if you don't have pump, Y90, to, to just to at all costs avoid uh, biliary obstruction. So I want to point out for the audience that there's a minority of patients that have liver-limited disease. That consists of maybe less than 20%, maybe 15%, and these are intrapatic cholangios that are limited to the liver, and what we would call oligomerosidic disease, sometimes very small areas of metastasis. So there's a small proportion of these patients and the pump is a fabulous therapy. I don't know, honestly, how you would interface that with other therapies like Sarah mentioned, Y90, uh, radio, uh, radiation therapy. Um, Bas, would you say that this is, uh, is there a selection criteria that you would use between these various choices of liver-directed therapy? Uh, Again, so my uh, disclosure, I don't have industry disclosures, but I am biased towards pumps. Uh, I am a pump believer. I think you have, if you have the pump, you should do the pump. I think the main advantage is that you treat the entire liver, so you also treat the satellites, which are, which are inevitably there. And uh, um, so if you can make that choice. Also, to come back to your comment, I think uh, uh, regarding the percentage of patients where the disease is confined to the liver, so if you look at this, ABC uh, subgroup analysis of Angela Lamarca that I presented, it was really 50-50. So 50% was liver only of all the advanced patients, and 50% had extra hepatic disease. So I think it's quite a large group, and I think there would even be room uh, for if you have like a, a small uh, a pulmonary lung meds, of which we know also from colorectal disease, that they very often do not uh, determine your short-term prognosis, and you have a large mass in the liver encroaching on your hilum, I think those patients could also still benefit from uh, pump or Y90. So Sarah, how would you make the decision in your practice versus Y90? Well, I will tell you about pumps is once they fail pump, they come to us. So when they fail, we can fix that. No, I'm just kidding. But we do, we do do posts. It's just a little bit more challenging to get to the artery sometimes. So in our practice, if we can confine the Y90 to two segments, two consecutive segments like that 6-7, and I can get a really high dose, that's when we tend to do Y90, um, as opposed to those central, those big central masses where it's, it's getting Y90 into that tumor effectively and not getting off target to normal liver. That's when we'll do it. RADSEG obviously is new kid on the block, sort of. Uh, for cholangio, it certainly is, but if we can get a segment and just do almost a surgical ablative therapy to that, we'll go with that first instead of 
an HAI pump. I think HAI pump in our practice is more for those big central that Y90 is just not going to be able to effectively get the tumor without getting off target to normal hepatic parenchyma. We have another question from the audience. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, sorry, sorry Dr. Yes. I just uh, replied to Dr. Roker. So, um, uh, NHSBT and blood and transplant, that's the overall national body for transplantation in the UK, um, are uh, considering uh, perihyla cholangio for PSC patients as extended criteria. Um, one of the how they're implementing that is in the form of a clinical trial called the empath emphatic trial, which is not going to start till next year, so unfortunately not eligible for my patient. But one of the preconditions of being entered into that trial is you have to have a biopsy proven cancer. So she's in a complete catch 22 of not having a tissue diagnosis and not being eligible for transplant. Um, so we decided with her just facing palliative systemic therapy, let's get a biopsy and, uh, and prove the point. So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether she gets uh, approved in Ireland. Um, hi, Samara Elias from the Mayo Clinic. I want to echo what Dr. Roca said. These have been excellent presentations that are quite informative and in looking at a variety of um, treatment options for our patients. So just a follow-up comment on the EUS guided biopsy, and then I have a question for Dr. Guest, and I have two more comments after that. Um, so the, the reason um, either EUS guided or percutaneous biopsy of the primary tumor is a contraindication for liver transplant is when we looked at this, it was Julie Heimbach looked at it with Mike Levy, I think about 10 years ago. We, we were still earlier on in our experience at Mayo. Um, the vast majority of patients, 90% had recurrence along the needle track after transplant. And so it became a contraindication. Um, and actually we've incorporated it into the ASLD guidelines that are primary biopsy um, of the tumor, biopsy of the primary tumor is a contraindication. We rely on uh, cytopathologic diagnosis more, so we look at fish, um, biliary cytology, and uh, biliary biopsies. And now th there is evidence that droplet PCR will be quite effective, so I, I do see that becoming uh, part of the armamentarium. So we have to rely on a variety of approaches, but unfortunately um, the outcomes with primary biopsy haven't been good. Question, on that MRCP, that extra hepatic stricture, it was really long, it looked very, the whole thing looks malignant. It, it's extending past the cystic duct insertion. So are you thinking this is a patient who has a perihylar anadistal, because it's a PSC patient, they have field defects, and so any discussion regarding doing an on-block Whipple with the transplant. Yeah, so I th I th this is uh, partly why I selected this case for discussion, because this has been, um, you know, raised about in terms of assessing the inferior end of the, of the tumor for, for um, uh, treatment. So back to her original uh, imaging at, uh, diagnosis, she had at least three extrahepatic strictures almost encompassing the whole extrahepatic bile duct. Um, and we felt that the mass looked w uh, fairly well circumscribed on the EUS. So, uh, and it was that that the FMBs come back positive. It's actually an adenosquamous cancer that she's, um, she's got poorly differentiated on a squamous cancer, but a small one. Um, so uh, do we assume that the mass is the, the malignant thing, or do we, as you say, assume that this is infiltrating down the extrahepatic tree, and does she need a Whipple? Um, in terms of her fitness, if you were ever going to get a patient that would be fit for a combined liver transplant and a Whipple, this lady's it. But whether that's a good idea in terms of outcomes, uh, the data on that is uh, pretty scanty. Yeah, we, we've we have, done... Uh, a, sorry. Uh, sorry, we, uh, we have uh, a question there. Yeah. You have a so I was just going to comment that we've done about 25 combined uh, liver transplant and unblock Whipples, and you're right, their outcomes are worse than, you know, all comers for that protocol, but they have improved over time, and the outcomes are still over. We're getting to the point where they are around 50%, um, and most of these patients that have PSC with a field defect, what we would do is we would, in, in this scenario, if there's a mass up there, we would just try to get brushings from the distal duct separately rather than pulling down brushings. Yes, yeah, so from the all of those were negative. Okay. 
I think that was very useful. Thank you for your comment. And if we have time, we'll talk about transplant for intrahepatic cholangio. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, I'm Kathy Hopkins, and I'm actually a patient with either intrahepatic cholangio versus mixed with IDH1 mutation and a weird kit mutation. And my question is two part. First, how do you guys decide on the size? Like mine was 10.3, goes down to 5.3, when you would implement radiation. And how do you decide, other than anatomy, if you're going to do Y90, or you're going to do SBRT, or you're going to do the pump? I mean, how do you decide which one you do with the patients, other than anatomy? Dr. White? Other than anatomy is hard. So there's, there's areas of the liver that are watershed for us. And watershed means that there's blood supply coming in. So in my institution, if you had a small tumor, five centimeters, and it was confined to a segment, what I would think to be a segment, we would do a mapping. And if the mapping showed that I'm going to have to have multiple different blood supply, you know, I'm going to have to put my catheter in multiple different areas, then that probably is not a good idea for Y90. We could certainly do a taste. Um, SBRT is going to depend on the location, right? So can they get it? Is it peripheral? Is it sitting next to a bile duct? What is the off-target toxicity going to be? So in our institution, that's how we would decide. And I hate to say anatomy, but it's really blood supply to that area, can we get it? Can we safely do a radiation segmentectomy? You know, five centimeter tumor also based on location, I didn't talk about it, but ablation is theoretically an option. Now five centimeters pushing the limit of ablation and our capabilities, but certainly that's also um, a possibility depending on location. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I hope we're gonna have some time to also discuss tenting and biliary infection because this is a real common problem with patients. Can we go to, uh, that microphone and then Shishir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Juan Valley from Manchester, UK. Uh, the, the question is very much about stenting. I think uh, Dr. Korkamp presented very compelling data regarding uh, the differences between endoscopic and percutaneous uh, stenting. My question is, do you think this was due to just uh, case selection and do you really think there's equipoise to a randomized study? I appreciate the need to do a randomized study and I'm a great believer in randomized studies. Um, but, but how do you anticipate the challenges of uh, uh, getting patients to consent uh, to such a clinical trial? Yeah. So glad you discussed that, Juan, because I wanted to remind the, the audience that patients with perihylocholangio infection and sepsis is really a common cause of morbidity and mortality. And uh, I don't know, Bas, there's clear clarity in this regard about whether, in which case you would do um, uh, biliary standing through ERCP, through PTC, how do you make that decisions? Well, how do you deal with recurrent cholangitis? Could you give us some idea of how, what, what is done at your institution? If anyone can do it, the Dutch can do it. Well, so, so two things. First of all, uh, I mean, for the sake of time, I couldn't go into the details, but the, the, the outcomes of ERCP and conventional PTCD, meaning internal, external, percutaneous biliary drainage, are equally poor in the Netherlands and everywhere across the world. They are equally poor. Uh, so what we do differently is do not cross the ampulla and don't leave an external drain. So uh, it's, it's very different. When we had done 10 patients, I already had no more equipoise. It was Almost. that obvious. Uh, and so I decided we're not going to do an RCT. But I talked about this with many people. And I think the challenge here really is, is that these patients, they go to an, uh, to, to an endoscopist when they get painless jaundice. Right? And when you get painless yonders, mainly only 10% is a perihydro obstruction. And I think very often these are misjudged initially. So I think in order to have an impact on the rest of the world, to sell this to the rest of the world, we need to do an RCT. Th there are some other issues, like in our center, this has been a single operator intervention for the first uh, 50 patients. Uh, we did really take in all comers, including, like I said, a 95-year-old and two patients on dialysis. It really, and I think the accrual rate was 100% of all eligible patients. But uh, we're going to do it. So this also was single center. So, the, so there are some actual reasons that you could consider there is some bias here. And, uh, but I think the only way to convince all the endoscopists in the world would be to do an RCT. And I, I think, you know, this really highlights the fact for biliary tract cancers that have such a nuanced management that what happens at the outset really matters. And this is why it's important for our patient advocates to really spread the word about you need to have an evaluation by a team that has experience doing this because you don't want, you know, quote, bridges burned 
at the outset. You don't want to be ineligible for a transplant because of something that was done if you're a good candidate. You know, in our institution, Y90 up front is a, precludes you from being considered for HAI because of increased risk of biliary toxicity. So what happens at the outset matters. So I think we have time for one more question from Dr. Mattel. Yeah. Sorry, not a question, just a comment. Oh, again, wonderful presentations. And I think this concept of control of the liver, you know, whether it be liver-only disease or as Dr. Javali was saying, you know, maybe small volume, extra hepatic disease, I think there is some value in control of the liver as we've seen. And, you know, we're often in these situations where it's case by case and this is what we do at our institution, this is what we do at our institution. I congratulate Boss, boss in, in true Dutch fashion for randomized controlled trials. They have an amazing ability to conduct and accrue and complete these trials. But I think here in this country we've struggled with that and we need to really focus on liver-directed therapy in combination with systemic for the right population and start thinking outside the box, whether it's HAI, Y90, SBRT, because we have a precedence of other trials that have failed to accrue in the HCC space and Calangio space, so we really need to start working together as a NCI community to be able to run these trials and potentially global collaboration with the Dutch group and other places that actually have shown they can do this and get this done. It's a general comment. Otherwise, we're continuously doing panels with wonderful cases that still people, it's not a general field change, it's case by case by case. So we need, we need to study this philosophy, I think. So thank you, Shashir. We're, we're out of time, and I just want to make a co final comment is that this session has demonstrated very well that the treatment of these cancers is multidisciplinary. And uh, so I want to thank Sarah, Rachel, and Bass for their contributions to this session. And I hope that some of the questions that were asked and uh, will be answered um, down the road with, with appropriate clinical trials. So we are all here, and we hope to interact with you further. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.